Good evening, and welcome to Wana Live, the reading series of the Writers Association of Northern Appalachia. I'm your host, Damian Dressick, and this is your other host, Christina Fasonic. How are you this evening, Damian? I am well, thank you, Christina. I, I, I have survived today's chaos, and I'm looking forward to. Uh, I'll be. I'm looking forward to, to becoming acquainted with a writer uh, that that I'm I'm not uh, not nearly as familiar with his work as perhaps I ought to be. So I'm really looking forward to hearing some new work tonight. Yeah. So tonight um, we have Tony Viola on the show. Uh, I have known Tony since a billion years ago, and I'm trying to remember. The last time I actually saw him in person would have been, I think, in 2001 or two or something. But it, I, I could be wrong about that. But that, that's the past. And the present is that he's a professor of English at Marshall University here in West Virginia, where he teaches literature and creative writing. He received his Ph.D. in creative writing at Ohio University and has taught at the University of Kentucky. His short fiction publications have appeared in... Gulf Coast, the Connecticut Review, Athlon, Journal of Sports Literature, and 521 Magazine. One story was listed in 100 other distinguished stories, Best American Short Stories, and another story received a Pushcart Prize nomination. All Lies Begin with Truth is his second novel. His first novel, The Art of Death, is available through KDP, which is Amazon. He has finished a draft of his third novel, book one of a post-apocalyptic young adult trilogy and is currently cool. looking for representation. So that's really cool. And he's working on the second book in that trilogy. So tonight I know that he'll be reading from his um, second novel, All Lies Begin With Truth. So let's bring Tony on the show. Hey, Tony. Hey, thank you, Christina. Thank you, Damien, for, for having me on here. And uh, it's good to see you again, Christina. I <laughs> we may have run. We may have run into each other during a um, uh, what, what was the MLA maybe conference. I maybe you're that. right. Yes, yes. Or maybe Spring Lit Fest at OU. That's possible. It's possible. Maybe one of those because I've I've gone back to a few of those over the years, and it, you're right. It could be an MLA, maybe with that that uh, crew of rabble rousers that um, we hung out with at OU. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> they got me in a lot of trouble. <laughs> You're right. So um, what will you be reading from your novel tonight? You said you'll be reading from some sections of it? Yeah, I'm going to be reading from a couple of sections. And um, I, I, Damien, I, I was not aware of your novel, uh, 40 uh, Patchtown. And I really wish I would have got, would have known about that prior to finalizing my novel because i think there's an overlap oh goodness well that's cool yeah and uh i read some of the some of the things about how you done the yeah you had done the research uh for that so i, I definitely applaud you on, on that but i'm going to be reading um let me let me get back to what i'm supposed to be doing here uh i'm going to be reading from uh the first three sections they're very short uh I'm, my novel takes place in a fictional town in western kentucky and it involves an energy company which happens to be fracking the local terrain and of course you know some people are in favor of it some people aren't and the novel is told through three perspectives and i i want to read a, a a short excerpt from each of those if if that if that works out so that sounds awesome we'll be back to learn more all right well thank you thank you all right, so the first uh, is from Erish Carroll. She's a 32-year-old activist. And she's actually visiting the town, and this occurs in November of 2014. So uh, here's that, that section. 28 hours on the Greyhound from Houston to Western Kentucky was bad enough, but throw in the rancid bathroom with no toilet paper, the screaming five-year-old, their rambunctious eight-year-old, and the trip evolved into an eloquent nightmare. Eris Carroll had boarded the bus at the downtown depot at 2 a.m. on Thanksgiving. In the first two thirds of the trip, she relaxed, read, and slept in peace. But after midnight, she heard the five-year-old crying for her baby, a doll, Eris assumed, and felt the eight-year-old kicking the back of her seat, apparently the young mother and children. 
no father traveled with them, had been picked up at a stop along the way while Eris was asleep, and she never, she never heard the family board. It was moments like these when she wondered why women had children. She never had the urge when she was younger, and now nearing the age of 32, still nothing. Since she lived mostly in conservative areas, people were always surprised to hear about her choices. A few warned her that time was running out. Some felt sorry for her, given she had not been blessed with such fine gifts. Others admitted that it was God's will, adding that she should be patient because he might not have given up on her just yet. Eris learned early on not to argue with people over their beliefs. You choose your battles, the ones you have a shot at winning, the ones you are the most passionate about. But what enraged her was how society tried to control her body. She was still young and always told she was attractive, so she received a lot of attention. Up until now, it seemed everyone saw her body as a vessel to be colonized, not something connected to her mind and spirit, not something she had possession of, something they had a plan for. Women were preoccupied with what came out of her body, while men were preoccupied with what they could put in it. So that's the end of her section. Now I'm going to read from Lionel Boone. He's a 50-year-old, sorry, 54-year-old ex-coal miner, and he's also the sole survivor of a kettle bottom collapse. And this happens in June of 2014. So Eris was uh, November 2014. This is June. We're moving back a little bit in months. Lionel Thaddeus Boone sat in the cab of his beat-up 1991 F-150, windows rolled up, AC blasting. He was parked just outside of Brackenfield Cemetery, where his wife, Lauren, had been buried 11 years ago. To this day, he never visited the grave, even though he promised himself every year he would. It was easy to make promises if no one else knew about them. It was also easy when the promise was weeks away, even a month. No immediacy present, so it felt like it wasn't real. And it was easy to justify breaking that promise. No, renegotiating it. When your anxiety crept up, increasing as the moment loomed closer, eventually paralyzing you. Visiting his wife's grave would mean he would have to visit the graves of his parents, his older brother, his brother-in-law, and all his friends and co-workers who died too young in the Marshall Coal Mine Collapse of 1994. Every time he passed the cemetery, Boone felt the presence of death. At 54, he felt it creeping up on him, catcalling his consciousness, especially when peering into the cemetery entrance, its narrowing roadway overcrowded by sumac, possum haw holly, and switch cane, its rusted iron gates permanently cast open like a mouth waiting to feed. So the last one is from Cass. This third perspective is from Cass Taylor, and she's a local in her early 40s. And this is September 2014. So we start November, go to June, and then September, and then everything else kind of, kind of goes chronologically forward. At the age of 41, Cass is still Taylor wrote in her journal to cope with her husband and his affairs with her hometown deteriorating around her, with her quickening age and fading beauty, with life's surging lack of appeal, its slow and inevitable path to permanent death. She no longer believed in God, in religion, in the convenient binary of heaven and hell. People were not special. They were like any other species with a difference of a consciousness, which simply meant we had the capability to create and build, not just inanimate objects, but a mythology to explain where they came from and where they would go. She didn't have this feeling just with the story of Adam and Eve. Science, to her, was another creation. It involved ingenuity, which is essentially invention. So she wasn't the type who held science over religion, pitting one against the other, claiming the former was superior to the latter. Her philosophy was simple. 
you came into the world developed physically, mentally, and emotionally, then you died. There was no one judging your actions or thoughts, no one determining what happened to you or your soul once you ceased to exist. You simply were until you simply weren't. Thank you. Wow, thank you for, for getting us into that. I love that. I, I always admire people who could do these like multiple perspectives. I, I really it, it, it almost makes me think of like 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 cubism or something where you kind of this is there's this thing and, and you're getting like these three different takes on it and, and you know you're, you're sort of forced to suss out uh, where each narrator is either reliable or 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 perhaps less than reliable. I I, uh, I love Cass. That was, uh, her the, the flatness of affect and and her her economy and uh, belief system. She's she's a character I'd like to I'd like to ride uh, ride around with for a bit. I um she's my favorite character. Um, originally this was written from Boone's perspective, predominantly, um, and then I needed to I, I felt I needed to just open it up a little bit. And then when I discovered Cass, um, I mean, I just, as a writer, I fell in love with her. I mean, she's just an amazing character. She's, um, when you read more about her, you understand her struggles and how even when she just, things just don't work out in her behalf, she is still a strong person. Cool, cool. Well, I was, um, I, I had the same kind of thoughts I was thinking about some of Jennifer Haig's work and she does that same work of, you know, drawing us in through these three different characters perspective and also able to move the narrative along within that. And honestly, I find that really admirable because I have trouble keeping my own thoughts in my head, let alone the thoughts of three different characters. And I mean, is there a method that you use? Do you primarily write from the perspective of one character for a while and then switch to another? Or do you go back and forth as you're writing? I mean, how does that process work for you? That's a great question. Um, first, I'll just say I love Jennifer Hayes' work. No, um, she's amazing, yeah. <laughs> and Heat and Light was an inspiration. I was going to uh, ask about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, I think I typically, I understand my limitations. So I'm a, uh, I'm a creature of revision and I'm a creature of radical revision. So the first version of this was told from Lionel Boone's perspective and it was like 530 pages. Wow. And, and I've cut that down to like almost 40% while introducing two new characters in their perspectives. So I think I have to start with what I feel comfortable with. And since Lionel Boone is a 54-year-old man, um, I, I can relate a little bit to that. Um, but then it, that, that allows me, like once that, that, that groundwork is there, then it allows me the comfort and the, the courage and the confidence to move on to something more adventurous. And um, that, that's, that's where, you know, Eris came about. And um, Cass was, I think... Yeah, I, there's a good part of cast that's that's a part of me. So, yeah, I mean, I was I'm we're just really fascinated about you know how that process works. Plus, I think that being able to tell writing students, you know what, I wrote 500 and some pages, and I cut probably 250 of those, but for the greater good of the novel, because you could have been stubborn and said, you know what, I wrote this, this is this is the way it's going to be. But your greater goal was this thing that lives outside of you, in a sense, this this work, this story that you're trying to tell. And I think students need to hear that um, as they're writing, because they don't like to do revision, at least early on in their work. They don't like it, at least my experience with it. You are preaching gospel, Christina. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, but to, to make, you know, to, to be serious about that. No, you're absolutely right. Um, and what I found that works is time. You know, you, you, you work on that and then you put it aside. And I do like other things. Like I, 
I think you swim as well. I swim. And when I swim, I have to think a lot because I have to distract myself from the fact that I'm swimming. Um, <laughs> right. Um, so I can think about like, what did I just do? Can this really work? I realized I w I'm not a, a known name and I'm, I'm trying to propose a 530 page novel. Are they going to take a chance on me? It's, you know, it's from a, an older white male heterosexual perspective. Um, you know, I have to think of all those things. So like, so, um, I mean, I, you're, you're right. I mean, I, I just, I just, you know, go with what I can do and then think, okay, this is raw material, even though it might be polished. Now I have to scale back and figure what an audience might like or what, what might appeal to an audience and editors. Right, for sure, for sure. No, I, I really actually I was thinking the same thing as Christina a little bit. I want to cut uh, like the like a thirty second like segment out of this and, and use it for my creative writing students, where it's like this is a you know guy who's been publishing stuff for a long time. He's you know he's nominated for some series, and I wrote five hundred pages of my own work and then cut it to two hundred and seventy, <laughs> and then yeah, it's like that's what a writer does. Like like it's not oh, yeah. every page isn't a, a delicious miracle. Uh, you know, it might be in the moment. Um, I also love the, uh, the the line. There's something really wonderfully hard won about uh, promises and uh, that that you don't tell anyone. Um, yeah. There's like, oh, you you live that. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, dozens upon dozens of times, and and that's why Lionel Boone was probably one of the easier characters for me to write. Yeah. Well, and I'm yeah. sure that his, his narrative had to be enriched by the two other narratives. Like as, yeah. as you're, you're, you're writing from their perspective and inside their own heads, I'm sure you're really thinking, going back and rethinking this other character, even though, you know, you feel like he's really developed, you introduce these other perspectives and you've got to be rethinking what he's thinking. A absolutely. Um, his character changed when I, you know, streamlined his his perspective and introduced the other characters. Um, he has interactions with Cass. He's primarily he primarily interacts with Eris because he summons Eris. Well, not summons, but he he calls for an activist to come into town because he wants to make a stand. Um, but then his there is interactions with Cass, which start off as sort of accidental. But they become more developed, and they be. And I think what happens is Cass, through her perspective, begins to realize that they're a lot similar than they, than she originally thought. So she has, she's judgmental about him. But um, as the novel progresses, she understands more about him. Wow, that's really cool. I, I love that and, and admire it because uh, you know I'm working on my first novel now, and there's one person. <laughs> and then I'm having trouble <laughs> maintaining that flow. So um, I really, yes. So um, do you have a copy of your book that you could show readers so they could find it? Yes. Yes. It, um, I'm going to do my best. To... There you go. Yeah. Uh, that's the... uh, yeah, it, it's backward. It's like a mirror. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, there we go. All lies begin with truth. Yeah. Okay, cool. And who brought this out, Anthony? I'm sorry, what? Who's your publisher for this one? Oh, it's uh, Black Rose Writing. They're based through Texas. Cool. In Texas, cool. yeah. That's right awesome. on. Yeah. That's awesome. It has been so fun having you on the show and catching up a little bit. And I, I love that uh, we can, I feel like there's an unlimited supply of bobcats out there that can come visit and talk about their fantastic work. So thank you for coming on. Well, th thank you again for, for inviting me and, you know, bobcat peeps and, and, um, and <laughs> I mean, I, I, I thank you. Also for for your book as well, Christine, I can relate to to some of the issues that you have addressed in that, and and I'm looking forward to 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 uh, or to, to looking at your book, Damien. As well. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much for coming on tonight, and everybody, thanks for watching. Yes, and uh, go out and get a copy of Tony's book, and we'll see everybody next week. All right, take care, y'all.